Hey folks, how you doing? Let me get Larry going here. Brady's Pamela, how you doing? Gaffney's. The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him Jesus Christ both God and man died was buried and rose again he died for our sin Okay, well, welcome, folks, this evening. Um, I have to tell you, I almost did not come on tonight just because today I spent over four hours on the phone with people from every, from all over the place. And, uh, and then a while ago, my eyes snapped shut right here, and I, like, I was gone for like two and a half hours. Don't ask me where I went, but I was gone. And then I woke up like, you know, 6.30. I'm like, oh my goodness. I didn't get anything done hardly today. So I had something that I wanted to do, but I always feel like I need to be prepared. If I'm going to do, you know, I don't like just running around in the Word of God and and um, just running rabbit trails. You know, that's what that's what people do when they're not prepared. They run rabbit trails. Like, whatever comes to your mind, oh, oh, let me go to that, you know, and I, I don't like doing that. I like to be prepared and everything done decently and in order. And I think that's what a lot of people appreciate. They like messages that take you from one place to the next, and then, boom, there's a whole picture in your mind. And that's how you study the Bible. That's how some of you, by the way, um, I, I got so many emails 
and one of the complaints that I get from people is that they'll listen to my messages, everything's orderly, everything, and then they'll listen to some detractors that are, you know, f trying to fix what I'm saying, and because I said everything in order and it painted a certain picture in somebody's mind when they're listening to somebody, they go, wait, 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 that's not what he said. And I have a lot of emails of people telling me, you know, I used to watch that guy, I'm not watching anymore, because I actually heard him say something that that he said you said, but I knew you hadn't said it, said that. And he misquoted it, and therefore now he's misrepresenting. And so that's why I like to be orderly, to paint a picture in your mind of what the Scripture says. And uh, so, you know, now, you know, tonight I'm not, that, I'm not prepared, so we're going to read. <laughs> okay, that's what I, I think I put the, the title there. Let's read Acts 9 and, 9 and uh, 10 or something like that. Okay, so last night I talked about that, that we can start reading through the book of Acts, just reading. And what we're going to do as we read, we're just going to look at the words. And what we're going to be looking for is we're going to be looking for words that as members of the body of Christ, who are saved by grace through faith, complete in Christ, have no works put upon us. Sure, yeah, we're created unto good works, but that's not works that are required for to maintain our salvation in any way, shape, or form. Like, uh, let's, before we begin, let's just open with a word of prayer, okay? Our gracious God and our Father, we're thankful this evening that we can gather around and fellowship around your word, the divinely inspired Word of God. I just pray, Lord, that this would be a time of blessing where people can see each other and fellowship with each other as we, you know, talk about the Scripture. And I'm so thankful for the salvation that we have in our Lord Jesus Christ, that today we stand in the grace of God and in a bubble of grace and we are secure in Christ as a result of that. And everyone who is watching who has trusted that Jesus Christ died for them and paid the penalty for them and was buried and was raised from the dead for them, they are in the grace of God. And they are saved and they are forgiven and they are complete in Christ and they're seated with Christ in heavenly places. That is the position of a Gentile in this dispensation of grace who has trusted and believed the gospel of his salvation. So, thankful tonight, Lord, that we can gather around this book that we trust, that we believe, that we rely upon to lead us from this life into the next. I pray these things in that name that is above every name the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, I said something in this, I just said something in this prayer that there are no works that are placed upon us as requirements for our salvation. As a matter of fact, I just, now you're going to need your Bible tonight, okay? Because there's nothing coming up here. You're just going to need your Bible tonight. And uh, I want to show you a verse in Acts 19. In Acts 19. Okay, we'll go back. We're going to read Acts 9, 10, and maybe 11 tonight. I'm not sure. We'll see how it goes. We'll see, you know. I just want to show you something. Because we're looking at language. We're looking at words. And like last night, we went from Acts 9 all the way to Acts chapter 17. Even at Acts chapter 17, we saw people at, who became followers of the churches of Judea. Paul did not establish the churches of Judea. Okay? We looked at that, we saw that in Galatians chapter 1. Paul did not establish those churches. He, those were church, little flock churches who knew that Paul preached the faith which once he destroyed. Right? 
And then I want to show you this verse. I want to show you this in Acts chapter 19. Um, this is, you know, this is Ephesus. And uh, notice verse 17 of, of Acts chapter 19. Notice verse 17. And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. Notice verse 18. And many that believed came. And what did they do? And confessed. And shewed their deeds. They showed their deeds. They showed their works. They showed that what they were doing. So let me ask you this. Is that language that you say as a member of the body of Christ, yea, I confessed and I shewed my deeds. Is that what you do? We're in Acts chapter 19. Is that what you do? And if you're going to be honest with yourself and with everyone else around you, and you're going to be honest with the Word of God, you're going to say, no, that's not my language. See what I'm saying? And last night, we went from Acts 9 to Acts 17, and we showed the language is not the language of salvation by grace through faith, apart from the works of the law. It's not. So... You know what I want to I want to do very simply, very basically. I just want to be honest with the word of God. I don't want to have to be honest with the thoughts and ideas that men put into the word of God that aren't there. You know, I just want to be honest with the scripture and let the scripture tell me what it says. You know, and then that way I answer to God for this not to a theological system. Each and every one of us, each and every one of us, nobody, well, very few, if there's somebody here who grew up in the grace movement, I'll probably guarantee they're not here tonight, okay? Because they already, you know, they already made a beeline out the door when their rewards were tampered with because of understanding some little flock stuff. But every single one of you who is watching tonight who has joined us tonight, you know that you came out of a denomination. And in that denomination, the pastor has an agenda to protect the theological system that represents that denomination. You know that. Every single one of you, no one has escaped that. Okay? And so, we came into right division thinking we left all that behind. We felt we, we left all that protecting denominationalism behind. And now we find out that there are groups of people now who are protecting a theological system that they were taught. Not that they figured out on their own. Not that they saw on their own. They were taught this, and now they're protecting that at all costs. At, even at the destruction of their brethren in the body of Christ, biting and devouring each other. And, you know, last night I shared with everyone, I said, I hope and I pray that you all stop responding. Just stop responding to them. Just walk away. You know, I'm not even espousing, unfriending, and blocking. I'm not even saying that. I'm saying just walk away. Go, to an, go somewhere else, you know. And even today I put a post in the Amos 3.3 group saying, look, you know, you, these people are rabid, okay? They, they, they've blown a gasket. Just walk away. Just forget about it now. It's not worth arguing anymore. It's not worth it anymore. You know, it's not... You don't have to defend something when, you're, when your position is in the Word of God. You don't have to defend the Word of God. Okay, they're defending a theological system. We're not defending a theological system. That's why there's no need for any one of us anymore to respond to any of the attacks or the name calling or any of that. You don't have to do that, okay? 
All we do is we go to the Word of God. That's all we're doing. Amen? So, there is no narrative when all you've got is a King James Bible and you're going, well, uh, this is what I see here. Let's... There's no more narrative here. Okay? I'm sick of narratives and I'm sick of theological systems. Okay, I'm sick of systematic theology. You know what I mean? So, we don't, we don't have to protect. We don't have to protect ourselves or protect what we're saying or protect anything. You know, King James Bible doesn't need protection. It just needs you to believe it. That's all it needs. Okay? Some people won't, don't want to believe that the words Church of God are the churches that Paul persecuted, although that's what he specifically says. They don't want to believe that. You know? They don't want to believe that he was preaching the faith which once he destroyed. They don't want to believe that. Well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for them. I do believe that. And I rest in that. And I'm, I have peace about that in my heart. And, you know, it's, it's so, it seems to me like it's so logical. Okay? So, I mean, we could bypass Acts 9 right now. We could. We don't need to read it because we, I mean, we've been here so many times. But we're going to read it. All right? And we'll just, you know, by the time we're done, we're just going to go through the book of Acts. And we're going to look in the book of Acts. And we're going to look for, we're going to look at the language. We're going to look at the words. We're just going to let the Bible say what it says without superimposing our ideas of what it says. Okay? So we're going to start at Acts chapter 9, verse 1 here. And I, I don't know how far we're going to go. I don't know how far we're going to get. But And I don't plan on doing a lot of preaching or comment, commentating or commentarying on it or, you know, just letting it say what it says. Acts 9.1, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest, and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth, and heard a voice saying, unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? The Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what will him? And he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. Now there are some people right here who will say, that Saul of Tarsus just became the first member of the body of Christ. Right there, right there. Just he's been he's been stopped in his tracks. He's on his way to arrest Christians and bring them to jail and punish them. Okay? And because he said, Lord, Lord, uh, he became the first member of the body of Christ. These verses don't say that, just like we looked at 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 16, that, that in me first, that doesn't say Paul became the first member of the body of Christ. That's not what it says, right? I mean, we've looked at that in detail, that he became, he was the first to receive this, to demonstrate the long-suffering of God, a blasphemer, injurious, uh, a murderer. The guy was a bad guy, okay? He was killing those who called on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he was the first, the prototype or a model of what that any man, any woman, regardless of the depth of iniquity, the depth of human defilement, the depth of sin that you have ever gone into, you are not beyond the reach of the grace of God. You're not beyond that. God can save any man on this earth. Any man, regardless of what they have done, if they recognize Jesus Christ died for them, he was buried, 
and he rose again the third day. And they trust that for the forgiveness of their sins. Guess what? God's grace wipes out their past in one instantaneous moment of time. Just like he did for you. And just like he did for me. Paul was the first to demonstrate that God, no matter how bad you are, will save you. Okay, that's the beauty of this gospel that we preach. It does not exclude anyone in the world, no matter what they have done. The, the price has been paid. Every sin that is ever committed in this world was paid on the cross of Calvary. Every single one of them. And all a person needs to do is believe. That's it. Faith is the only response that gr grace accepts. That's it. All right? And, you know, I said this last night at the beginning of our Bible study. I said, here we are today, right? We're in 20... Today is April Fool's Day, 2021. And here we are. We sit here with a completed King James Bible on our desk or in our laps or wherever you happen to be sitting right now. And we have trusted and we have believed the gospel. And every single, every single member of the body of Christ today, today, right now, and there are people saved in all denominations, okay? There are plenty of people who have their, their Bibles in their home and they've read them and all the, I mean, my, you know, my wife grew up in a congregational church, her life, her entire life. She did not understand salvation. However, through the preaching and, you know, the, 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 the sermonettes and whatever they do in those churches, she had enough understanding that when she heard the gospel, it was like, oh, yeah, oh, I have to personalize it. And so... She, she was saved. But there are plenty of people in denominations. There are, you know, in the fundamentalist, when I, where, you know, the independent fundamental Baptist that I was in, plenty of people are saved. Plenty of them are saved. Same with in the Pentecostal church I got saved in. I was saved. I believe Jesus Christ had died for me and his resurrection was for my justification. I believe that. Now, did I understand everything? No, no, but that, that gospel, that gospel is in a lot of places and people who believe that gospel are going to be saved, okay? And so every single person in the body of Christ today got saved by grace through faith and nothing else. And here we are in 2021 talking about how this all how this came to us and there are people who will rip your head off if you don't see it exactly the way they see every detail right i mean there's a preacher in the grace movement who's kind of famous for his sermons or he has one sermon that he preaches at almost every conference he goes to about listen it don't matter how you got to where we are today because where we are today we all agree that salvation is by grace through faith in the death burial and resurrection of jesus we all agree on that some people are acts 9 some people are acts 13 some are acts 14 some are acts 18 some are acts 20 some are acts 28 every single one of them who understands that who they are in christ today every single one of them we're all in the same place today, right now. How we got here, there are differing views. There are differing opinions from men who know their Bibles, but they see different things, right? And the part that is, um, is like totally, totally throwing me for a loop is this Grace Works Rewards movement, okay, that we found out recently that's what they are. They're grace, works, and rewards. And they just can't handle that I don't agree with that anymore. And they're like livid. 
and they want to rip people's heads off. And that's not grace, folks. That's not grace. And that's why I think it's very sad. Here we are in 2021, all saved by grace, all standing in the grace of God, all rejoicing in what we have in Jesus Christ. And there's this group of like livid, livid, like they're foaming at the mouth, like the 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 the, the, the guy that was possessed the, the in the Gadarene tombs there, right? The demoniac from Gadara, who thrust himself around in the fire. You know, he was going nuts. That's what they remind me of. The only time you see people acting like them in your King James Bible is people who are demon possessed. That's the only time you see that kind of action, okay? <laughs> so, I'm not saying they're demon possessed, okay? I'm just saying that's the only time in your King James Bible you see people acting like totally whacked out is when they're demon possessed. And I cannot for the life of me understand why, okay? I don't agree with you. We don't agree with each other about exactly where Paul became the first member of the body of Christ. We don't agree with that right now. Like, okay, so what? So what? Man, go on with your life. <laughs> you know, there's one thing, there's one thing about me. I will tell you this. I do not go visit preachers I don't agree with. I just don't do it. I don't have the time. It's like, okay, that's what you want to believe? Did you believe that Jesus Christ died for you? Did you really believe that? You did. And you're trusting that. You're trusting that he died, he was buried, he was raised again. You're trusting that for the forgiveness of your sins? Well, brother, I'm going to be honest with you. I really don't care how you arrived at that place. Thank God you're saved. We're going to spend eternity together, okay? Now, how you you, you don't you think it's Acts 13? Uh, okay. So what I'm going to I'm going to take out my rope now and hang you? Because you're not agreeing with me that it's Acts 9 or you're Acts 18. Oh, really? That's how you see it? But you're saved, right? And you're in the body of Christ, right? Wow. You're in the greatest place you could possibly be. You think it happened somewhere around Acts chapter 18? Okay. What do you want me to do? I don't care. I don't care. But that's, I'm not seeing what you're seeing as far as Acts 9 being the place where Paul became the first member of the body of Christ. I'm not seeing that. So, I'm supposed to get hung now? I'm supposed to be beheaded for this? <laughs> because some people want to behead me for this. It's like, wow, man. You know, we're in the body of Christ. What, what more could you possibly want today? So, that's why, as we read... We're going to look for our language. We know our language. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourself. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. If we don't find that language and we find something else, then we shouldn't try to force ourselves into someone else's language. We should not try to do that. King James Bible is not confused about what it said. God's not confused about the language he used. Amen? <laughs> Amen? So... So now we're at verse 10, and there was a certain disciple now. There, there's some words right there, a certain disciple. Every time you see the word disciple in your King James Bible, it's talking about people who were part of the little flock who believed that Jesus Christ was the Messiah of Israel. They're not members of the body of Christ. Ananias is obviously not, a, he's a kingdom saint, and he's called a certain disciple. You're going to find those words, certain disciple, three times in your King James Bible. And every time... You're going to find he's a kingdom saint. He's not a member of the body of Christ. Why would you anybody want to try to wrest that out of the scripture and make it say something that it's not saying? Unless you have an agenda. Unless you have a theological system that you are protecting. And that if you, if you admit that somebody, a certain disciple... If you can't admit that he's a, a kingdom saint and you put him in the body of Christ, now you're protecting a theological system. See, because now you can't change your mind and agree with the King James Bible because your pride's going to be hurt. 
and you'd have to admit you're wrong, and God knows that's not going to happen with many people today. Many people today are not going to admit they're wrong, okay? Because that's just not how it happens today, you know? So, there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And you know what? And, and, and here's something else. These are the, this is the first place you find the words, a certain disciple. Well, that's the law of first mention, right? A lot of people don't believe that the King James Bible has this thing called the law of first mention. But the law of first mention has been proven over and over and over again to be a law uh, that, you can, that can be relied upon, that, that you can trust, that, that is... When the first mention of words is used in your King James Bible, the very seed out of which that word will grow is found in those first words, okay? And you can trust it to be the same and, and have continuity in it because that's the way the King James Bible work, uh, works. Because that's where the sovereignty of the Holy Spirit in the inspiration of Scripture comes in. This is not man's book. This is God's book, you know. We can trust these things in the Word of God, you know. God knows how He used His Word. He knows, right? That's why we do word searches. And boy, I got people who are doing word searches and they're finding things that maintain a continuity of sovereignty of the Holy Spirit in the inspiration of Scripture that is undeniable, undeniable. And so, that's why. We're just going with the King James Bible, not with what people are saying about it. Just, there it is. And the only thing you either, there's only one of two responses you're going to have. Either you're going to believe the King James Bible, or you're going to believe what somebody said about it. And I'm not the guy who believes what other people say about it anymore. I'm, I'm kind of done with that in my life. <clears throat> and I want all you people who are on this journey to take on that same that same, you know, looking at the King James Bible, what does it say? Because I don't. That's all I want to know, right? That's all you want to know. That's why you listen. That's why you listen, because you know I'm a King James man. I'm not gonna. I'm not variable in this area. There's no like. There's not like a little space of gray area in my life where, well, maybe there's a place where the King James Bible is not right. May no, there is none. No. Nope. If you think there's a place in the King James Bible that has a gray area, it's because you're something you're not understanding. Not because of the King James Bible, that's for sure. Okay? So, verse 11. And the Lord, okay, the certain disciple, verse, verse 10. And there was a, a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth. And he hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all them that call on thy name. This guy is very reluctant. He's heard about this man. Okay, this, is, this man is violent. Violently and exceedingly mad. To the point of, of insanity. Okay, that's how mad this guy is. That these people are believing that this imposter, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. is the Messiah, you, you know? So, naturally, there's going to be some reluctance in Ananias. Verse 15, But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Now, just stop here for one second. And think about this. Just think about this, just for one second, okay? If Paul, at this moment, 
becomes a member of the body of Christ, then that means he's going to be preaching salvation by grace through faith. That's, that's what it means. Because that's what a member of the body of Christ does. Okay? So when he goes to the kings and the children of Israel as a member of the body of Christ, just imagine yourself if you live in a town or a city where there's a synagogue, okay? And go knock on the door of that synagogue or the parsonage next, next to it and the rabbi comes to the door and say, yeah, I'm a member of the body of Christ. I'm saved by grace through faith apart from the works of the law and I want to talk to you about this message today. Uh, what kind of reception do you think you're getting if you're getting any reception at all at that door of that, of that man? Okay, a law-keeping basically a law-keeping Pharisee in the, of the 21st century. With that, you know, we read that Floyd Baker thing last night, the logical that Paul became the first member of the body of Christ here. Really? And then verse 16, For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Now, do we suffer in the body of Christ? Let me tell you how you suffer, okay? You suffer if you if you have pain in your body right now, it's probably because of what you're eating. Okay? <laughs> it's self-imposed suffering, okay? But when you think about it, okay? This guy is about to enter into suffering you don't know anything about. You can't even begin to understand what this man is about to be launched on in his journey. There's no way you can even under, enter into an understanding of it, let alone be participating in this kind of suffering yourself. Okay, The Gentiles of the dispensation of grace that make up, that are in the body of Christ, they may suffer... There's emotional suffering, you know, there's financial suffering, uh, you know, there's maybe some sickness, you know, and there's, you know, children rebelling, there's, there's all kinds of things in families, but that's, you aren't called, you're not called, like, to suffer for his namesake and, and, and get a reward for it. That's not what you're not called, you're not called to that. I would say 95% of Christendom today does not suffer. You know, there are missionaries out there somewhere in Arabia or Iran or, or places like that. Yeah, they're getting killed. That's right. That's right. And I understand that. But even that did not gain them extra points. It did not. They're saved by grace just like you and me. They decided to go there. They decided to go there and share the gospel with those people and they ended up getting killed. And of course, nobody's happy about that and nobody thinks it's a good idea. But you need to understand, they're, all, they're saved by grace. If they were saved, a lot of those people go there with the wrong gospel. I wonder if they're saved. I don't know. There's only one gospel that saves today, right? So, but here's a man. God said, I will shoo him. I'm going to show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Okay? We're, we, you and I are not called to suffer for his name's sake. This man is about to bring the gospel of the grace of God to a bunch of Gentiles. And it's not happening too soon either, because we saw last night, all the way till Acts chapter 17. Those people are, not, there's not a Gentile in the book of Acts, at, even at, as far as Acts 17, that is added to a body of Christ, a, the church which is his body. The, you know, last night I made a couple mistakes when I said, uh, those in, in Christ before Paul, Romans chapter 16, verse 7, those in Christ before Paul, right? There were thousands of them. I mean, Peter preached in, at Pentecost, there's 3,000, and he preaches again, there's 5,000, not counting women and children, and there's thousands of them. They're in Christ before Paul. Well, guess what? 
if they're in Christ, they are a body of Christ. But they're the body of Christ with an earthly hope. Yeah, they exist. They exist. Okay? We today are the church which is his body, which is completely different. When you read in 1 Corinthians 12, 27, ye are members of the body of Christ and members in particular. Look, look just keep your finger here. Let's just look at that, okay? Because that has, that has to do with this right here. But look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, okay? And you're looking here at all the gifts. All the gifts the word of knowledge, the word, you know, prophecy, discerning of spirits, the word of wisdom, manifestation, all these things, right? And then in chapter 12, verse 27, Paul says, Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. And then notice he goes on with this whole list of God had set some in the church, first apostles, prophets, teachers, miracles, gifts, healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? No. Are all workers of miracle? Have all the gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? No, 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 no. But notice they're members in particular. I got news for you. There is nobody in the church which is his body that is a member in particular. You don't have any of these gifts. And these, you know, these people, they were doing something and bringing a gospel to us. And they were anointed, supernaturally anointed by God to accomplish things. Not just because they didn't have a King James Bible sitting in their lap. And then when the King James Bible showed up. You know, these things that were in part were done away with. That's true. But these people are members in particular. You are not a member in particular. Today, we are the church, which is his body. Which happened at a certain time. But it did not happen in Acts chapter 9. And so last night, I, t I said that these people were... Uh, I forget exactly what I said now. But I referred to us, the church, which is his body, as members of the body of Christ. And these are the people who are the members of the body of Christ. They have an earthly hope. They don't have the same hope you and I do. They have an earthly hope. Okay, We are the ones who are seated with Christ in heavenly places. The church, which is his body. Every single member of the body of Christ today, right now, you're seated with Christ in heavenly places. You don't have gifts. You don't have tongues. You don't have healing. You don't have prophecy. You don't have any of these miracles, helps, governments, diversities of tongues, word of knowledge, word of wisdom. You don't have any of that in the church, which is his body. You understand? There's a difference. And here's where a lot of people go, no, nah, it's all the same thing. Well, that's the thing, see. You want to believe that this is the same thing as the church, which is his body. Listen, that's your choice. You can believe that if you want to. I'm certainly not going to take out a rope and try to hang you for it. You can do that because you want to know the truth. It doesn't matter to me. That doesn't matter to me if that's what you want to believe. Okay. I just see it differently. And that's all I'm sharing with people. I see that differently. You know? But we're in the body. We're in the church, which is his body today. You know where you see those words? I'll show you. Ephesians chapter 1. Look. Look. Now, I'm going to show you something, okay? Like, you know, in the book of Acts... The, the little flockers who become the election of grace of Romans chapter 11, they're called saints. They're the saints. The saints at Jerusalem. They're the saints. Throughout the book of Acts, the saints. The, the saints are the saints. They're the ones who are called to help Saul of Tarsus bring the gospel of grace to the Gentile world. Watch, watch this. In Ephesians chapter 1, Notice verse 16, and we're going to read. Cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you 
Gentiles may give unto us Gentiles the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him what the eyes of your understanding being enlightened what what does he want them to know that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints now he's telling these people i want you to know what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints that's the little flock i want you to understand these people I want you to, I want you to, man, I wish there was a wisdom and revelation that would come upon you that you would have an understanding of the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. But notice, and I want you to understand, you Gentiles, you people who are the church, which is his body, I want you to understand what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body. That's you and me. We're the church, which is his body. Not members in particular. The church which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So there's the, the word, there, there's the words that define you. They define you, they define me, they define everybody who's saved by grace today. You're part of the church which is his body. You're not members in particular where gifts were in functioning and operating. No, I'm sorry, that's not you. Now you can say oh that's a bunch of bull and i don't believe what you're saying that's fine that's fine you see it the way the way you see it and i'm telling you i was seeing it the way i'm seeing it okay verse acts chapter 9 again <clears throat> Verse 17, and Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. Yeah, that's entrance into the body of Christ. Yep, absolutely, right? Is that how you became, a, that how you entered into the church, which is his body? Is that how you got in, by being baptized in water? At this point in Paul's life, you know, like, some people will say, well, he was saved, and Ananias just did there what Ananias does. He's a kingdom saint. That's all he knows how to do. They took him and they dunked him in water. No, that's not all. No, because Ananias was told by the Lord what to do to Saul of Tarsus. Ananias didn't just take it upon himself and think, you know, uh, Lord, I hope you don't mind, but uh, we're going to dunk this guy in a tub of water, okay? That's not what happened. These are instructions from the Lord to Ananias. He is not taking this off the top of his head and saying, I think it's a good idea. This man right here, Saul of Tarsus, was just put into the kingdom program. Whether anybody likes it or not, that's exactly what happened right here. And let me just share this with you real quick. You think about this, okay? For 4,000 years... Israel has received promises from God, from the prophets, that a, that a king was coming, that a Messiah was coming, that a kingdom was coming. We looked one night at all the promises in the Old Testament of a kingdom that was coming. How John the Baptist broke the silence and said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom is on your doorstep, Israel. Your king is here. Behold the Lamb of God. He's here. He's here to... Get you to repent 
and cleanse you and save you so that you can fulfill the, the promise that God made to Abraham that you will be a blessing to all the nations of the world. He's here on your doorstep. What are you going to do with him? He came unto his own and his own received him not. Remember that? After 4,000 years, after 4,000 years of this promise, <laughs> now it's here, right? So what do they do? They get an extension of mercy for one year. They get an extension of mercy, okay? And then they stone Stephen. They reject the offer of their kingdom. So why? Why would anybody think that right here in these verses that we're reading in Acts chapter 9, that after 4,000 years and they reject their Messiah, body of Christ, you would think, right, that there would be a cooling off period. There's going to be a cooling off period. We call that cooling off period the transition, the transition period. These people who have just rejected their Messiah, who have just killed their Messiah, which was prophesied for them for 4,000 years. First prophecies, Genesis 3.15. Right? Everything that happens in Israel is to try to get them ready for this moment. And when it finally happens, <laughs> it finally happens, they reject it. They just reject it. You think, really, that right there the body of Christ began? And Saul of Tarsus is the first member of the body of Christ right there? Well, if you just believe the words on the page, you're going to find out, no, at this point, he becomes a kingdom person. How do I know that? Let's keep reading. Okay, after he's baptized, verse 19, and when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus, the disciples. And here's something that you can be you can you can follow through in the book of Acts. I mean, you go to your blue letter Bible or your e-sword or whatever you use and look up the word disciple. You'll never find the word disciple in connection with a member of the body of Christ. Paul never uses that word as a for a member of the body of Christ. He does not. I mean, you know, if he did, it would be clear, but he doesn't. You have to read body of Christ into the words disciple. You have to read it into it, but it's not there. Body of Christ is not there. Okay? So he was with the disciples. He was with those who had believed that Jesus Christ was the Messiah of Israel. Verse 20, and, then, and what did he do? And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. That's the first thing he preached. Is that what you do as a member of the body of Christ? The first thing you do, you start preaching, hey, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. You can't become a member of the body of Christ. And, and believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God for your salvation. That's not how it happens. That's not how it happens. But that's what happened to him. And now, people want to say he's a member of the body of Christ, but that's not what you get out of those, those verses because that's not what a member of the body of Christ does. He doesn't do that. So... The body of Christ is inserted here by men. And it started a long time ago, okay? But if you just read it as it is on the page, you you go, well, he can't be a member of the body of Christ. He's going to the synagogue and he's preaching that he's the son of God, which means the cooling period, the transition to eventually bring a message to the other family has begun, okay? 
And then verse 21, but all that heard him were amazed and said, is not this he that destroyed them which called on his on this name in Jerusalem and came hither for that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests? But Saul increased the more in strength and con confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. Now, you have to ask yourself this question. How was he proving it? How was he proving that this Jesus is the Christ? You need to understand, this is the initial beginning of what's called the gospel of God. The gospel of God is not the gospel of the grace of God. Okay, The gospel of God is something completely and totally different. Okay, Notice how he proves it. Come over to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. This is where Paul goes in Acts chapter 17, verse 1. And now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollyanna, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures opening and alleging opening and alleging he was setting alleging is setting before them that christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead and that this jesus whom i preach unto you is christ that's how paul proved in in, in uh, acts chapter 9 this is how he proved, that's in verse 22, but Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is Christ. How did he do it? He did it by opening and alleging, by opening the scriptures. He reasoned with them out of the scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead. That this Jesus whom I preach unto you is the Christ. That's what he did. Verse 22, proving that this is very Christ, the Messiah. So here we are. We're beginning this journey with Paul. And at this juncture, we don't see any language that belongs to the body of Christ. I mean, you can try to make it say something that it's not saying. But I don't want to do that with the King James Bible. I just want to go, this is what it's saying. I don't want to add to it. I don't want to take information from a theological system and then bring it in here and make this say what the theological system says. I don't want to do that. I just want to be honest with the scripture. <clears throat> Okay, then verse 23, and after many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. <laughs> they didn't believe. They didn't believe this guy had changed, right? Verse 24, but their laying await was known of Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Wow. Listen, this guy had done a lot of damage, and they're not laying to kill him because he's a member of the body of Christ preaching salvation apart from the works of the law. No, they know what he did. Verse 25, then the disciples took him by night and led him down by the wall in the basket, in a basket. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed. The word essayed means tried. Okay, it is a, um, it is a French word. Jaseye, it's French. That's actually literally a French word. Jaseye, I tried. He tried to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, just like Ananias was. And believe not that he was a disciple. See, they didn't believe that he was part of them, a kingdom saint. They didn't believe that. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way, and that he had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. So here's Barnabas. He proves to these people, listen, 
He is one of us. He saw the Lord on the way. And he's preaching Jesus boldly. He is one of us. Just the fact that Barnabas, at this point, recognizes Paul as one of them and can convince the other guys that Paul is one of them, that just assuages their, their fear. And basically they just go like, okay, they must have still had some doubts in their mind, but, okay, so in verse 28, and he, Saul, was with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem. Now, does that sound like a, the, 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 the activities of a person who is the member of a body of Christ who was saved by grace? Does that sound like that's what that is right there? He's going in and out with them at Jerusalem? And he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians, but they went about to slay him. Now, who are these Grecians? There's a lot of controversy, folks, over who the Grecians are and over who the Greeks are. They're mentioned in the book of Acts. Okay, some people say the Grecians are Jews who speak Greek. Okay. And the Greeks mentioned in there are literally Greeks from Greece. You find all, you'll find them throughout the book of Acts. Um, so the Grecians are Jews who speak Greek. Uh, yeah, who speak Greek. Jews who speak Greeks. So verse 29, he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians, but they went about to slay him. Which when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarsus. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea. Now, this is so important right here in the book of Acts. Because there, the churches of Judea and Galilee and Samaria were not established by Paul. These are little flock churches who believed that Jesus Christ is the Messiah of Israel. Okay? You cannot read the dispensation of grace churches into this. And I'm thinking that I think a lot of people have done that. And I just can't, you know, I do you see that happening here? I mean, just be honest. Is that what you see? Churches of Judea are now body of Christ churches? Paul had never been there. Paul had never been there. But remember, we looked at Acts chapter 2. Look, Acts chapter 2, in verse, down in verse 8, How hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and dwellers of Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia. But there's, see, at Pentecost, there's people from Asia. There's 3,000 saved right here. Okay? So... There's churches going out there. They're being established. They're, this is not Paul's churches. These are churches that exist from Peter in Acts chapter 2. But some people want to put them, want to put the body of Christ right there already. Like the dispensation of grace is in full bloom and these people are saved by grace. Man. That's not what's happening. That's not what's happening. Verse 31, Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea. They had rest because they knew now that Saul of Tarsus was one of them. That's why they had rest. And walking in the fear of the Lord. See, look at these churches, okay? Okay. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. And that's the first part of Paul's journey right here. That's the first, his first steps into, he's been baptized by, in water, <coughs> filled with the Holy Ghost, 
going to the synagogues, preaching that Christ is the, is the Son of God, that he is this very, proving it, proving it, that, that he's the, the Son, the one you killed? No, he's the Christ, man. Th that's what he's doing. And then finally, Barnabas. No, man, he, he's one of us. You see? And that's why he was with them in Jerusalem, going in and out, coming in and out at Jerusalem. With them. People who had believed that Jesus Christ was the Messiah of Israel. He's not trying to tell them, You're, by grace are you saved through faith, not, of works of, not by works of righteousness which ye have done, but according to his mercy. You know? For therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. None of that is going on here. Paul does not have the revelation of the mystery. Put it that way, okay? In any way, shape, or form. In any sense of the word. And then we arrive at, at uh, verse 32. And Peter... Peter enters the scene. And it came to pass, as Peter passed throughout all quarters, he came down also to the saints which dwelt at Lydda. The saints, the saints. These are people, these saints are people who have believed that Jesus Christ is the Messiah of Israel. And there he found a certain man named Aeneas, which had kept his bed eight years, was sick of the palsy, Eight's the number of new beginnings. And Peter said unto him, Ananias, Jesus Christ, make it thee whole. It's time for a change, Ananias. And Ananias is a type of Israel who's been in his sick, sick. And this is what Jesus Christ came into the world to raise them from the dead, to raise, you know, to, to deliver them from demon possession. Possession. And Peter said unto him, Ananias, Jesus Christ, make it thee whole. Arise and make up thy bed. And he arose immediately. And all that dwelt at Lydda and Saron saw him and turned to the Lord. These people turned to the Lord because they saw something. Not because they heard a gospel of grace or the gospel of the grace of God. Now there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabatha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. And she has to be. These kingdom saints are filled with good works and alms deeds. That's their, the character of them. And it came to pass in those days that she was sick and died. A picture of Israel again. That's what they did. They they were sick, and now they they they're called, they're, they're, their program is postponed. God has saved Saul of Tarsus, but his first part of his journey is to go to these people and tell them what they did and who Jesus, who the person they killed was. This woman was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did, and it came to pass in those days that she was sick and died, and when they had washed, they laid her in an upper chamber. And forasmuch as Lydda was nigh to Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent unto him two men desiring him that he would not delay to come to them. Then Peter arose and went with them. When he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber, and all the widows stood by him, weeping and shooing, the coats and garments which Dorcas made while she was with them. But Peter put them all forth and kneeled down and prayed. And turning him to the body said, Tabatha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when he had called the saints, the saints, this has not changed to any member of the body of Christ yet. That's not there yet. The saints and widows and presented her alive. And it was known throughout all Joppa. And many believed on the Lord when they saw the miracles. That's when they believed. They believed that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. 
That's what they're believing, okay? There's no salvation by grace here. And it came to pass that he tarried many days in Joppa with one Simon Tanner. Tanner. Now look, I'm going to stop here. We've already been over, over an hour. Believe it. Okay, we've already been over an hour. And I'm preparing something. I was going to prepare something today based on yesterday's message, the churches of Judea and First Thessalonians, the Thessalonians were became followers of the churches of God, which are in Judea. There's a reason why I did all that. But like I said today, I got caught up with a bunch of things. <laughs> and, uh, okay, so we're going to stop here. And here, look, as we go through this, okay, and this is what I believe we're going to find fascinating. And we're going to find interesting. Because as we go through the book of Acts, we're looking, we're looking for our language. We're not looking for a theological system. We're, that's not what we're looking for, okay? We're, we, we don't want a theological, we don't want systematic theology invading the Word of God and interposing itself in the Word of God. We don't want to do that. We just want to read the Word of God and just let it say what it says. And as we go, we're going to ask ourselves, is this our language? Is this how we're saved? And then we're just going to let the Word of God say yes or no. You know, we're not going to try to make it do or say anything, anything. You know what I mean? And uh, to me, that's the most honest thing we could do is let the Word of God tell us. Do you agree with that? Everybody should agree with that. Nobody should be disagreeing with that. But there will be people who will disagree with that because they want to insert their theological system in here. They want to make it say what they want it to say because that's what's been said since J.C. O'Hare, okay? That, that, this is all... Paul's now got the revelation of the mystery, or he's getting it progressively, but he, it started here. No, no, it did not start. It did not start here. He met Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, and Jesus Christ told him who he is. That's all. That's all that happened so far. And Paul is going to go to those synagogues, and he's going to tell them, uh-oh, that guy you guys killed, <laughs> wrong guy. That wasn't the right thing for you to do. So, we're going to stop at Acts 9. We'll pick up at Acts 10. I don't know when. Uh, maybe maybe next Wednesday or I don't know. I don't know. I have to see how this thing goes. The other thing I'm preparing is very important also. You know, but... Anyway, what are, what are we going to close with here? Um, how about this? Larry Tidwell, ladies and gentlemen.
Thank you, Rita. Susan. Amen, Brady's. Thank you, Brother Larry Tidwell. Appreciate you and your singing and your songs and your heart and your love for the gospel. And um, somebody just mentioned that, you know, we're going to continue reading. We're going to go all the way through every word of the book of Acts, every word. But we're going to do it without a narrative controlling what we're reading. That's the thing. That's the thing we're going to do. And that's where your King James Bible comes into play. Okay? Because Psalm 138 verse 2, God hath exalted his, his word above his name. You know what the name of the Lord is? His name is Jehovah. And out of that name Jehovah comes all of the attributes of God. And God has, a, has, has magnified his word above everything that he is. In other words, his word is his bond. It's his bond. It's who he is. It's a, re, it's, it's, it's a reflection of him. So why should we not do the same? Do we want to magnify a theological system or a narrative? Or do we want to magnify the word of God with him and just let his word tell us? <laughs> I think everybody's in agreement that this is what we should be doing. Amen? That's what I think everybody's in agreement with here. So, I already kept you for an hour and a half. So, I'm going to let you go. And, um... Remember, you are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. All right, that is, that is yours as members of the church, which is his body. Amen. And if I slip up sometimes and say body of Christ, it's because I've been saying it for so long, but we are the church, which is his body. We are not members in particular with gifts and signs and wonders and everything. That's not you and me. So I know... I know that's not what everybody was taught. 
in the past. I understand that. And I, I realize it, it needs a time to adjust to that language. You know, there are people who've been saved 30 years. Like we had a lady in our church. She, she passed away now, but she could not stop saying born again, no matter how. And of course, I just, I never, I didn't try to correct her or anything, but she was so glad she was born again, born, you know, because, you know, she came out of the church on the hill and she came with us. And so she, she kept saying that. All right. And now we realize, you know, the language sometimes is hard to, you know, we're reconciled to God. We're, we're part of the church, which is his body. And we got there by grace through faith, apart from the works of the law. And so our language is different. And so even I now have to get used to saying the church, which is his body. As opposed to body of Christ and members in particular, which none of us are. Amen. Anyway, let's close with a word of prayer. Our gracious God and our Father. We're so thankful that we have a King James Bible. There are people who would love to take this book away from us in this world right now and burn it. That's why it's important. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. It's important to have God's word in our heart. But Lord, I thank, I thank thee for these people here that have gathered that are on this journey of just letting the scripture say what it says. Not, we're not trying to create something new we're not creating a new group, a new denomination, a new a new anything. We're just people who say, hey, Lord, we just want to know what your word says. Apart from any interference from the many philosophical views and the theological views that men have imposed into the word of God. We just want to know, what does the Bible say? And for that, we're thankful, Lord that you gave us a book that we can do that with and let you tell us what it means just by reading the words in fifth grade English. So I thank you, Lord, for these people who've joined us and pray that this was a time of blessing, a time of edification. I pray they enjoyed the fellowship with each other and they recognize that they are of one mind and that they are brothers and sisters in Christ not biting and devouring each other, but edifying each other in love. I pray these things tonight in that name that is above every name, the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, folks, thank you for, uh, <laughs> for being here tonight. I didn't know I was going to do anything seriously. It was like 10 of 8, and I started turning on my laptop and my camera. And I go, right, i got to get on there, and I'll, we'll just read something and talk about it. So there you go, okay? So now we'll see you hopefully Monday morning. I'm sorry, yeah, Sunday morning, okay? So thank you for being here. Love you all. And uh, remember, you're in the grace of God. That's where we are today, okay? I'll talk to you later.